Hey, Lane, it's Aaron. Did you say that there was a, a link in the chat? Oh, I think you're on mute. <laughs> Thank you. That would sure. be helpful, wouldn't it? <laughs> sure. It's, it's in the, um, so I posted a chat, but I wonder if maybe it only shows to people who join, like to the people who were joined when I posted it. Oh. Can anybody else tell me if you see the very, very top of the chat? Do you see a message from me with a link? Nope. Okay. I'm going to repost it. Okay. And Thank then, you. Sure. Thank you for telling me. Yeah. <laughs> quirky little features of zoom that I just don't know until yeah <laughs> we try okay does everybody now see a little message with a hyperlink yep okay perfect and let me know if you can't log in I tested it out and I don't think you should have to log in to your NTSU like office 365 to look at it but um it may prompt you for that I had my husband test it who's not an MTSU person and he could look at it so I'm crossing my fingers that you all can see it too yeah, it's good. I can see it. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Okay, well, I don't want to wait too long. It's 102 and I know I want to be respectful of all of your time. So we'll go ahead and get started. And then um, anyone who comes in late should be able to jump right in. Um, what we plan to talk about today are the D2L Brightspace Pulse application that students and faculty can download to their mobile devices and the D2L Daylight um, instance and how you can design appealing and accessible and responsive online courses for both of those um, apps and the, and the website. So we'll dig right in. So if you're not familiar, the D2L Brightspace Pulse app is downloadable in the Google Play Store and the App Store for Apple devices. It enables students to log into their courses using a mobile-friendly design. They can access all of their courses right there in the mobile app. They can also elect to receive notifications for grades and announcements. I have found that particularly useful because sometimes I have trouble with my students not actually reading their feedback and checking their grades. And so some students have shared that they like that part of the app because they instantly get notified whenever I post their grades and feedback. Students can also easily see deadlines for all of their courses in the D2L Brightspace Pulse app. They can read and reply to discussions directly in the app. They can complete quizzes directly in the app. And it's really easy to switch to the full Brightspace like desktop version without a new login. I really like using the Brightspace Pulse app whenever I'm just, you know, in between tasks and I can just pull up my mobile phone. It does not prompt me to log in every seven days. I've heard from a couple of people that they still are prompted to log in, but I have not had that um, experience. And so I really like it for that reason. I can just quickly check to see if students have emailed me. I can respond to their messages. I can check to see if anybody's posted any questions on discussion boards. And it's very easy to reply back in there. I always tell my students, I don't recommend they try to do all of their coursework in it. But for some of my students, they have shared this really is the primary way that they access their online course. And so I've tried to design the courses that I teach to be as friendly for mobile devices as possible to meet the needs of that population. The D2L Daylight instance, you all will recognize after MTSU rolled out this version in 2018. So when you log in on your desktop, you can tell this is the Daylight instance because now we have all of these lovely images that are attached to our courses. Um, the interface is much cleaner and the fonts are a lot easier to read. It's also really easy to pin your courses for easy access. I love that feature. I happen to be a course developer that clones about 30 six courses every semester and so instead of seeing 36 classes in my fall 2020 list it's nice to just be able to pin the ones that I'm actually teaching so that I can get to them very quickly you can also customize the banner image for each of your courses in daylight and the other primary advantage is that the responsive design of daylight improves the experience for all users accessing courses from mobile devices. And the great thing is for a lot of those features you don't have to do anything the D 2 L interface actually does it for you. But what we're going to talk about today is how to actually design some of your content to be responsive in a way that D 2 L doesn't actually automatically do that for you. 
So responsive design and D2L daylight, the, the main features are that pages in a responsive design will adjust to the screen size of the device that the user is using. So regardless of whether I'm accessing a course from my mobile device, from my tablet, from my laptop, or from a 27 inch desktop monitor, all the content is gonna display appropriately. In D2L, the homepage, discussions, and the quiz tools automatically do this already. So when your students happen to be logging in to D2L, even the website version, using their mobile device, they can respond to discussions and it's actually gonna resize that all already for you. You don't have to do anything to make that part of your course responsive. However, your course content does need to be designed intentionally if you want it to be the most responsive for your users. So how would we do that in D2L? Well, one idea is to use HTML instead of Word or PDFs because when a student uses a Word or when a student accesses a Word or PDF file in your course, they're still gonna have to do the sort of pinch and zoom um, that we're all very used to with doing on our mobile devices in order to make things larger. And if you use HTML, they will not actually have to do that. Um, there's also some things that you can do using the HTML editor tool that if you just have a tiny, tiny bit of HTML knowledge, which I had none before I started using all of these. So I will say that it's pretty easy to use and I'll tell you one important feature um, about how to do that. And then the best news is that D2L actually releases responsive templates. I have been using the 2.0 version in my classes since I completed some redesigns in 2019. And as I've been preparing for this workshop, it turns out they actually released version 3.0 back in August. So those are the ones that I'm going to introduce to you today. And so I want to show you a couple of examples about responsive versus non-responsive design. And then we'll actually log in and we'll show some examples of that. And we'll walk step by step to show you how you could actually deploy these templates in your own course. So I know these images are kind of small, but what I want to be able to show you is in the first image, this shows an example of my course from 2018, where I was uploading a PDF document for my student's assignment schedule. And this is a screenshot from my mobile phone. And so you can tell that a student in order to read that is going to have to sort of put both fingers on the screen and enlarge that image to be able to read it. And they're gonna to have to scroll up and down and side to side in order to tell. The PDF version is obviously really friendly for students who want to print it out, but for a lot of students, they're not printing, especially a lot of the digital native students that we're teaching. The image on the right, and we'll look at some of these actually in real time, but the image on the right shows a responsive version of an assignment schedule. So you can see the student does have to scroll vertically in order to see the multiple weeks, but they don't have to scroll horizontally and they don't have to pinch. D2L has resized that appropriate for a mobile phone. If we're looking at that from a tablet, it's going to be even a little bit larger, but it's still going to be something that adjusts automatically to the student student screen size. And what we're going to look at today are some of the design resources that D2L makes available to you that you don't even have to do anything with. So the first is a link to the D2L templates 3.0 website. On that website, we're going to look at the zip file that you can download to your computer so that you can upload those templates to your computer um, and use them in your course. There's also a Word document that's a guide about how to use those templates and how to edit them. I've also linked to a couple of videos when you download this presentation this um, image is actually a video that shows how to import them to your class if you need a reminder after our workshop and then this video actually talks about how to edit those templates and what I'll do is I'll show you I want to show you step by step how to do those and I'm also going to show you some examples in my own course where I even further customize their templates for my course design and then I also have linked a helpful were, um, internet site from DePaul University with tips about making your course mo more mobile friendly that you might find useful. So I want to stop here and let's take a few minutes for questions and then we will actually be able to look at the D2L um, instance and I'll show you some examples. Does anybody have any questions just real quickly about responsive design or the D2L mobile app?
Um, I guess I have a question. If you, okay. if you did want something that the students like, so, so my students are working on multiple screens. Okay. Um, so if you did have something where maybe they did need to print it, so like they might be watching a demo video for how to use a piece of um, digital art software, following a handout, and then using their computer at the same time. Okay. Is there a way to attach a PDF that they could still print? Can you still add that or? Th there sure is. Let okay. me do this. Let me end this presentation and let's go on to D2L and I'll actually show an example of that. So I, I have a couple of ways that I have addressed that same okay. issue. Um, let's check real quick for chat. So, okay. So the slides um, are available in the chat feature. I'll link them one more time. And then let's see, note I understand note take, my note taking skills are not fast at all. Okay, so I have sent again in the chat for those of you who've joined recently, there is a link there to the slides and all of the hyperlinks in the slide should function for you if you want to use these resources. So please let me know if you don't see them. Okay, so let's go to D2L real quickly and I'll show you a couple of different things. Okay. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, can everybody now see my D2L homepage? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right, what I want to show you first is um, actually, I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to share from my tablet device. So let's do it this way, and that way you can see. Okay, now you should be able to see my iPad and I'm going to pull up here. The Brightspace Pulse app is the app that looks like a heartbeat. It's orange background with a white icon. So what you're seeing now is how a student using a tablet is going to see their courses in the Pulse app. So you can see it's the same images that you would see in the desktop version. And what I want to do first is show you an older course and I'll show you a little bit larger than we saw in the PowerPoint, an example of what the assignment schedule looks like to a student on a tablet. So you can see if I'm on a tablet, I might need to zoom and pinch in order to see all of that content clearly. In addition, whenever I'm looking at something like a PowerPoint presentation, D2L, of course, is just showing me an image of that file. So students are able to just see those and they're sliding up. It's not interactive like a PowerPoint might be if they're looking at their desktop. And then you can also see that whenever students are using um, a video tutorial, for example, Daylight automatically, and of course this is an old, this course is two years old, so this link isn't going, but you can see some of these things that daylight already automatically is resizing for me. Um, but all of these links that are external, it's going to take me to the website. And so now I'm navigating an MTSU website and it's going to be responsive because the MTSU response the MTSU website is responsive. So the primary issue that a student's going to have in a course are things that you've uploaded in Word, things that you've uploaded as a PDF, or things that you might have even designed in HTML, but they actually don't have the style cascading like style sheet design guide that help them be responsive. So then I want to show you a different example from a responsive design course. So in this example, we'll look at the assignment schedule. And so you can see in this version, the assignment schedule, the student isn't having to zoom and pinch. They can scroll and they'll be able to see all of that. You can also see this is one of the templates from the 2.0 version of D2L. And you can see how they have banner images at the top. They're also using different fonts. So you'll notice this one actually, their heading style is in a red font. They have changed that for the third version because red isn't actually a recommended font color for um, accessibility. So you'll see some improvements in the version 3.0. 
but you can see the the actual look of this is much different it looks more like a website it looks more like the kinds of sites that students are used to using on their mobile devices another example is if you use an embed code and learn how to make it responsive anything else that you add to your course will also be responsive this is an example to where i use a service called calendly in my course so that students can request a zoom video conference and it will automatically book it on my outlook calendar and so you can see that the student is able to scroll up they're able to select a date select a time confirm all in their mobile device and they can enter all of their details but the look of this they haven't had to actually zoom or go outside to a different website in order to do this so there's a lot of features that you can use using those styles uh, those templates that will do all of this for you when you download the templates there's nothing else you have to do you can use their default photos and you could just completely copy and paste everything that they're doing so to to address your question though about how to do things if you might actually want them to have a pdf version so one example for that is in one of our courses what we've done is for powerpoint for example we switched to google slides so that students could actually go through the slides without them looking like an image file like a powerpoint and so I want to show you, here's an example where we have the Google Slides version, which we have clearly identified by saying this is the Google Slides version. And then you can see, well, excuse me, this one actually isn't Google Slides. This is actually a presentation that I designed. So you can see here, I've actually embedded a video inside this that is actually sized appropriately for my tablet. If we were to look at this from my mobile phone, it would resize appropriately for the mobile phone. And then you can see I've embedded images in two different columns just using the template that they provided. And then at the bottom, you can see all different kinds of things. I can use this at the very bottom. It's called a jumbotron where we're putting the references. There are all kinds of things. And you can see I've also put a logo at the bottom. That's also part of the template. So you can see this looks a lot different than just a Word document that's just text. It's a way to make your course more appealing and engaging to learners who really get pretty tired pretty quickly of just scrolling through a lot of black and white text. But then we've also done a printable version for students as well. So if you do have a document or something that you want students to go through and they might need to have two screens open at once, you could put a PDF version also in your module stating that that is the version that the students should download if they would like to use that as they're actually going through and doing something else on a different screen. That's one solution. Another solution is that you can actually download these items. A student can download these items from their mobile device. So from the assignment schedule, for example, students always have the option and will actually have to deploy the MTSU version. So you can see that I've just very quickly gone from the actual app version to the daylight version, and I have not had to log in again. As a student, they could click on their assignment schedule and D2L at the bottom of that page gives them the opportunity to download. It's going to download as a zip file, but the student can then unzip it and it will actually be the HTML version. So I'll show you here. We can actually save that to files, which I've already done it before, so you can see it there and then click save and then the student could go to their files and they'll see the stripped down html version so it won't have the images it would just be the text of the assignment schedule so they could do that for any other document by going to that section of their d2l page and let's go back and then clicking the download button so there are still ways even to make an HTML version of the page. They could still download it. It would still be a version that they could refer to. D2L does say that they don't recommend that you use the daylight templates if you do intend for students to do a lot of downloading and printing. It's really designed more for students who are doing most of the things in the mobile app. So for a lot of our assignments, we do include two different versions. We'll include the HTML version, but there's also a printable version for students 
who would like to do that if you have something that's pretty complicated or for your example where you would actually like them to refer to a document as they're doing something else. The other thing that I want to show you now is I'm going to stop sharing the mobile version and I'm going to share with you my desktop version and I want to share exactly how you would download these templates and use them in your course. So what I would like to do is take a version of a course that's not active and we're going to go to the D2L responsive template page. And even if you don't use the link that I've provided you, if you Google D2L responsive templates, you're going to be easily able to find the version that says version 3.0. And this is their comprehensive resource for all things related to these templates. The first thing that I recommend that you do is to download the item that's called Brightspace HTML Template Guide, and that is actually a Word version. It's going to have step-by-step -step instructions. You can see it starts with how to download the templates, how to upload them to your course, and then how to enable the content and apply a template to your course. We're going to do all of those steps in just a minute, but I would download that first. And then you're going to download this version that says Brightspace HTML template, which is a zip file. So all you need to do is download that file, which of course my computer doesn't want to do while we're on Zoom, but you would download your file. And then all you need to do is go to your course and click edit course. And you want to do this from Manage Files. And you would want to go to Upload. And then all you need to do is find that zip file on your computer. So I'm going to open that file and then click Save. And then you should be able to see the zip file in your Manage File from the course where you've uploaded these templates. The next thing that you'll do is just click unzip in the menu. It will say that this might take a few minutes and so it unzips in the background. And then once it's finished unzipping, you're actually going to notice a notification up in the discussion area. So you can do other things while you're waiting for that to download and then you'll see up here like yesterday when I deployed this to a different course that the file has been unzipped. So as soon as you see that, then you'll actually be able to use your templates. And then what you'll need to do next is go to your content section. So assuming that you've already unzipped your files and you're ready to deploy these templates in your course, if you wanted to create a new file, I'm going to add a test module that's hidden just so that we can practice. So in our test module, I would just go to new creative. Oh, excuse me. Let me start backward. First, we want to tell D2L where we want it to look for these templates. So we'd go to settings right there, the little wheel settings wheel. And we want to make sure that this box is clicked that says enable HTML template. And then we want to change the path and we want to find the templates that we just uploaded. So in my case, these were called Brightspace HTML templates. I'm going to select that path and then I'm going to cl click save. And that's going to mean I don't have to look for these templates every time I create a new file. And then to actually create a file, I'm going to click new, create a file. And then in my document template, you will see now there are multiple uh, document templates available to me. They start with the number double zero and they end with the number 10. I can alternatively browse for another template. So if you had version 2.0 in your course as well, you could browse for those also. But these are the newest version that are available. So let's say that I want to create a file for a module introduction for our test module. So you can see that automatically when I click that document template, it has loaded for me 
an example of what this page would look like. There is an image at the top, which I can change easily, but just by using the HTML editor tool, if you wanted to change this image, you could click on it there, and then you could click on your image file and you could replace it. Then I can just edit the text. I could say, this is module one introduction if we wanted to. And then I can replace their default text, which are really helpful instructions telling you exactly what things you need to consider as you're doing this. For example, recommended banner image size is at least 1200 by 400 pixels. Most of the images that you're going to find from free image sites such as Unsplash or Pexels or Pixabay are going to meet that requirement. And then you can see because this is a module introduction page, it's got learning objectives. And so it has bullet points for each learning objective and I could just delete their text, add my text for each of my learning outcomes, and then I could save it. And you'll see here, even if I needed more learning outcomes, I can just hit enter and the template knows that it needs to add the next number in the sequence. And then I could click save and close. Oh, first I need to enter a title. So let's do test module introduction and then save and close. And then you'll see what this is going to look like on a computer. So then on a module, a mobile device, such as a tablet or a cell phone, all of this white space to either side of this are going to go away. And the student is probably going to see a smaller version of this image at the top and then all of this will cascade below. Um, this makes it very easy. I can also edit my logo. And so this makes it very easy to create a module introduction file and then to use this same option, the, the module introduction template for all of your course modules. And then they will all keep the same look and feel. And when a student finds this page, they'll come to know this is a module introduction. Another example of a course file that you could create is going to be a video lecture. So let's say you're recording some lectures for your students or you want to insert some videos from your students from YouTube or another source. You could choose the video lecture option. And then this template, as you can see, it has a different image at the top and then video lecture is its heading. And then you can see that it has embedded this video. It's centered on the page and the student does not actually have to go out to an external link. This is recommended as a best practice for students because then they are not having to click multiple links in order to access their course content. And so by using this template, the video is automatically going to resize appropriately to the student's screen and everything is going to appear correctly, whether they are looking at it on a desktop computer, a mobile device, or on a, a tablet. And so you can see there's also the option to put instructions down below. They've left plenty of uh, information there for you to edit. And then so you could do test video lecture, and all you need to do is save that. And then you'll see what it's going to look like to a student once it's deployed. So the student would be able to click that video, directly watch it without having to link out to YouTube or another source. I want to show you a couple of other examples of things that are new in the 3.0 version that are really interesting. We'll create a file again, and then we're going to select a template called accordions. And so an accordion is something you will have experience on multiple websites that you visited before. It's a way to chunk information for students without completely overwhelming them with a very, very long page of text in your course. The accordion enables you to put a heading for each section and then the content can be collapsed. So what we're gonna do is I'm just going to click test here and we're gonna save it exactly as the template has it so that you can see what this would look like in practice. And you'll know exactly what you're looking at when you see it. So this is an accordion where you can actually click this and that 
information would then be revealed. So for a student, you could see that you might use this for keywords if you wanted to put your keywords here in the definitions below, or even if you wanted to do an assignment if you wanted them to have each section separately. If you have a lot of long content, this is a very helpful way to break it up for students to not overwhelm them. And then the other feature that they have that's very similar to this is called horizontal tabs. And the horizontal tabs feature is a template that all you have to do is edit it. And you'll see it's going to work very similar to the accordions, except for instead of un unrevealing them and revealing them, they're going to actually be different when you click on different tabs. So I'm going to click tabs template here and save it and you can see what this one's going to look like as well. So a student could then click tab two and the content for tab two would be revealed and then tab three and the content for tab three would be revealed. And so this is actually so easy to do and once you have that deployed all you have to do is click edit HTML and you'll actually be able to get back into your file and you can edit that content. So you can see they've got headings here and then they have all of the content. All you would need to do is delete that information and then type what you would like that information to be. Click save and close. And then when we go down to the bottom and click tab four, we're gonna see our content that we created that says test. So this is a really helpful and interesting, I think new way. It's a way to present your information that's more visually appealing in a way that students are used to using in other sites that they are accessing. The final example that I want to show you about one of the file types is just called um, elements. And this page shows you all kinds of different tools that you could use on a page. I often use the elements page just as a resource to copy and paste different things that I want to include in my course content. So you can see here if you wanted an ordered list that uses the large green numbers instead of the small numbers, you would just copy and paste. You can see here, it's probably very small for you, but it says ordered list large numbers start copy. So to use this on your page, you would just copy all the way down to where it says in copy, and then you would just copy that information, and then in a new file, you could paste it. So you don't have to use everything from this template in your page, you could just use bits and pieces of it. Here's another example of where it uses a block quote. So if there was something you really wanted to draw attention to, you could actually do it this way rather than just putting it in quotation marks. The other example is for a jumbotron. You can highlight information in a green background rather than a white background. You can also use a call out, which is something that could be really helpful if you want to draw students' attention to something in particular in your presentation. There's also examples of doing a table. And then in one of the examples I showed you earlier, it's two column panels. So you can do this. And the great thing about this particular example is that when students are viewing this on a mobile device, the mobile device will actually resize this and the panels won't be side by side. They will be actually stacked. So using this template, it has all of the HTML coding behind it, but you don't have to know how to do any of that. You can just use this template and it's gonna do all of the hard work for you. But your students are going to benefit because they're actually going to be able to access anything that you put in your course content on any size device, which is really helpful. And then again, you always have to use um, a title or it won't let you save it. And then I know I said that was the last one, but I do want to show you one more, and that's with images. So I do like to insert images that are related to the content because I think sometimes students are visual learners. And so using an example or an image is sometimes really helpful. It breaks up all of that text. And so they do have an image template that is really helpful and it will do the really difficult work of aligning your image with your text for you. So you'll see there's a couple of different options. If you would like for your image to appear on the left and then you would like all of the text aligned with it to the right of the image, you would just start here, copy all the way down to where it says end copy and paste that into your page. You can do the same thing to align the image in the right. 
And then you can also do the same thing to have the image align full. And I use this a lot in my courses on the course announcement page. So I want to show you an example of that. I'll show you some different ways that I've used the responsive templates on my home page, and I'm actually going to go to a newer course. On the home page, you'll see that one strategy that I use to engage with learners is each week I try to upload, I use the discussion feature to do a weekly agenda, and I try to use the home page to just draw their attention to that discussion. So each week I might include a new image and I've used the tool that I just showed you where I copied and pasted that code from that template. It look, I say code, it doesn't look like code from the part you're copying and pasting, but what we're copying and pasting really is the code. And then I paste it into my news announcement. And so it will center that image there, but it also resizes the image no matter what kind of device students are using. So if my students just logging in on Monday and they're starting out their week, they're gonna see these images sized appropriately for their phone. So this is another place in the course that you can actually use some of the information from the templates without using the entire template. Another example of that is in the discussion feature. So this fall, I experimented with a new tool where I did a poll everywhere for my students. And what I had them do was go to the poll everywhere and put in the five adjectives that they think best describe them. This is what we did for our icebreaker. And so I actually was able to embed that poll centered here so that students, as they started entering their um, answers, that is displayed in a responsive manner for the students. So there's ways that you can do this even without a template, but the templates make that a whole lot easier. And depending on what feature you're using, most of them can give you an embed code that you can then just make one or two little edits to in order to make it responsive. For this one, I want to show you how you could do it, even if you didn't have a template. One really important feature that you can use is this little tool down in the HTML editor, which is the little HTML brackets. And that's gonna open up the code for you. And I think this was really scary for me the first time I tried to use it. But what I learned is I could make one little change in the HTML source editor that would help make this responsive for my students. And it's very tiny here, but when you do this, you're gonna notice in the code, there's gonna be a code that says width. And most of the time when you insert an image or a video, or like I've done here, a poll everywhere from a different site, it's going to have a number there. So it might say the width should be 550. But if you just take out 550 and make that 100%, it's going to mean that the width of whatever you've entered is going to display at 100% of whatever your user's screen will allow. So that's one tiny little HTML editing trick that you can use in order to make your content responsive, even without the templates. Um, and then the worst thing that can happen is you've not done it quite correctly, and then you just relink it again and try again. So it's something I think is a pretty low stakes way to experiment and try with it. But now I make, I make this edit in just about anything that I include in my course, because it does make it so much easier whenever you're accessing the content from a mobile device. So I know that's a whole, whole, whole lot. I want to show you one more example and recommendation from D2L that's in this course. What D2L recommends that you do if you're going to use the templates is to create a hidden module, which I have done here. You can see at the bottom of my course, I have this hidden module that I've called D2L Responsive Templates. And what I did is I created a new file from every single one of the templates that are available so that all I have to do is look at that file and I can see exactly what that design is like if I want to deploy it. It's really helpful rather than having to go into that choose file and then 
select each one, this is a way for you just to see, oh, if I want to use the course title and I want my course description to be responsive, this is what it could look like. So it's a really easy way to just scroll through and see what all the different options are. There's module introduction, which we used before. Here's a meet your facilitator one. I can show you what this actually looks like in a real course because we do use this in our courses. And it's a way just to make your instructor information a little more interesting. So you can see it still has the banner image from my course, and then it has a prompt for you to include a photo, and then it includes different sections um, that you can fill out. So it's just a way to make this look, and when a student looks at this on a mobile device, it's gonna look exactly like it should for the size of their screen. And then you can scroll through and you could see all of the other different options. The final thing I want to show you before we stop for a question and answer is how if you want to edit these for your course, how you could do that. So you can see in my course, I'm using a common theme of the books. That's my banner and I use that on a lot of the pages. But then for the content, I also created pages that are specific to my course for every single course element. So one example is learning outcomes. So for my learning outcomes page, I use this banner consistently and I use the same heading structure and same bullet structure for every single module or unit in the course. And then I also use a common banner for a presentation. So when a student sees this particular image, they're going to know this is actually a content presentation for the unit. So they could scroll down. This is where they're going to find embedded videos. This is where they're going to find the content that they need to know in order to succeed on those module activities. And then I also want to show you another example in a different module where you can actually embed other things from other sites. So this is a uh, key terms and practice activities. So this course tends to be really vocabulary dependent. Students have to learn a lot of concepts that they're not used to. So what I did is create the Scrabble tiles, always signals to the student, this is when we're gonna be talking about key terminology. And then I've listed the key terms, but then I've also embedded using a responsive embed code, practice activities for the students using an outside source called Quizlet. So students can actually do this flashcard activity and they can do this from their phone. So this is a great way to show how using responsive design, students can use their mobile device and play these kinds of tools just like they would get a game on their phone. And there's multiple different kinds of choices. They can also do like a matching game where they could actually look at this and say, um, do the matching and make them go away. And then there's also a self test and all of this can be done directly from the Brightspace Pulse app or directly from a mobile device and it will all show appropriately. And all of this, all you have to do is use that um, HTML editor to make them 100% using the embed code from this outside source and then I can embed them directly into my content. And then the final way is for when we have in our course um, Dropbox assignment instruction. So all of the Dropbox assignment discussion, uh, excuse me, Dropbox assignment instructions look the same. So a student knows when they see this banner, this is going to be for an actual assignment that they're going to turn into the Dropbox. And the way that I did that was actually just to go to my manage files area and in the actual master file in the course, all I did is I changed that photo that came from Brightspace to be one of my very own. So we can do that here in our manage file section by just choosing edit file. And then I can expand that. And then if I want to change that photo, all I need to do is select a new photo from my computer. We'll just see, I'm sure I have something here that we can use just as an example. And I would click add, and then this is just decorative. So I'm not gonna enter alt text for now. So for example, this isn't a great picture. This is not something you would use, but it demonstrates how you would change that image. I've chosen a poor one because I chose my screenshot, but you can see that it changed the image in the actual master file. So if I saved this, in my files area, 
Then when I go back to content and click create a file, when I choose file zero zero blank, then this picture that I have replaced will show every time I choose that file. So that's a way that if you don't want to use those defaults that are included by Brightspace, which a lot of them are just, you know, a computer or something else, you could choose a, an image that would appear behind this course title that's going to be something that's specific to you. So those are very easy changes that you can also make in your course using their template, but even customizing them a little bit more. That's where I also changed the logo. So I was able to create a little logo for PRST 3995, and then I included it in all of those templates in my file structure. So I will say this kind of took me probably a few days to really start playing around with it. But once you download the templates to your course, it's so easy to edit them and then everything will be responsive. It's amazing. It's one of those things that makes a huge difference in the way that your course looks, but doesn't actually require any more time than it would to upload a file from Word or a PDF. Um, I typically was using all Word and PDF documents in my course design before. And when I underwent a redesign of both courses, I chose this way instead. And I have been really happy with the way that it has gone. I will say I probably wouldn't in a course that I wasn't redesigning. I'm not sure that I would go to the effort to replace everything um, because it does take a little bit of work to replace things if they are Word or HTML. But if you're embarking on a redesign or a course development, I think that these are so helpful and made a really big difference, I feel like, in the way that our course feels and in the way that it functions. So I want to stop sharing because I know that's a lot um, in a very small amount of time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the chat feature here and we'll start answering some questions. Okay. So do students know to download the Pulse app? That's a really good question. So we do put information about the Pulse app in our course. So I'm a course developer and we just include a section that talks about the Brightspace Pulse app recommending that students download it. I don't know if they would know to download it if you don't tell them. Some of them may have done it for previous courses, but I think it's a great practice just to let them know it's available because it does make it so much easier for them to see at a really quick glance what they have coming up due for all of their classes at any moment. It's a lot easier, I think, and logging into the website version, especially now that for logging into the website version, we have to every seven days re-enter our login information. And I have not had to do that on the app. It's very easy to just log in once and I never have to log in again. That may not be the way that's supposed to work. So I kind of am scared to say that out loud because I don't want ITD to maybe make a change and take that away, but that's the way it's worked for me. Um, Let's see, does D2L automatically update these features? So I, I think, and I think Scott's on the, in the workshop and so he might be able to speak to this better, but I think that D2L does release updates monthly for Brightspace. Um, the Pulse app would automatically update if students have enabled automatic updates on their mobile device. Um, but I think most of the time the features are pretty small. But for the templates, you actually do have to actively manually download those to your course. Those would not be updated by D2L. Um, let's see, if the video is on a password protected site, the student would still be able to click it and then they might have to still log in to that site using the password, but they would still be able to access it that way. It doesn't, you know, that it should, they should be prompted to enter the password and then the video should display. I'm not using any password protected video, so I don't have a lot of personal experience with that. So it might be something you would need to play with and look at it from a mobile device on your own device to see how that does look to you. Um, especially if you wanted to see what it would look like from a student's perspective. Um, as far as Panato videos, um, that's a good question, Dave. I don't know. I'm not using Panato videos. Um, Kim or Tara or Scott, who are in the workshop, do any of you all have experience with using Panato videos in one of the templates? This is Tara. I, I have not, no. Okay. 
So Dave, that might be something we need to play with. I don't really have, and we could ask Carlos because I do think Carlos is, um, Cornell is the Panopto expert. He may have some experience with that that we could ask him. Claire, your question about accordion, I don't know that it's preferred. Um, from what I could find, there was really no recommendation about best practice. One thing that it did mention is when students are looking on a mobile device or a tablet, if you have a lot of information there, it gets really tiring for them to look at it and it gets easy to miss things. So they recommended using things like short descriptions of things so that they could see several things at one time. I think an accordion would be useful for something like that. Um, I think when I would be trying to think about how to use an accordion, I would probably not use it for my main content, but I could see using it for something like definitions where you would want to have the term at the top and then you could reveal the definition in the accordion. I think that's another instance where you might also want to have that displayed in a different way. For instance, for students who don't purchase the textbook, if you're using a textbook, they may not have that vocabulary available to them if they're not using the textbook. And if you had it in a different way where all the terms were defined without them having to click the accordion, that's probably a little bit more user friendly might be an example of a place to use them in both. I just wanted to show them today because that was not in the version 2.0 that I've been using. That's something new and um, I thought it was kind of neat to be something interesting to play with. Um, Thanks, so Lynn. The, sure. So Lindsay's question about the HTML editor and screen readers. So PDFs and screen readers, that may be true. My students, I had one student who had a severe visual impairment and he did not have any trouble with the HTML versions of the course. Um, but I don't know because I don't have a ton of experience with that. I've only had a few students who have at least sh shared with me that they're using a screen reader. That might be something that I should um, investigate with our Disability and Access Center. But from my reading, a JAWS reader should be able to read the HTML with no problem because those, those templates are using what's called a cascading style sheet. And so it is already notifying in the HTML code that this is a heading or that this is paragraph. So it should still signal to the screen reader, this is a heading, this is a paragraph, just like it was if it was a PDF. But I'll let, if anybody has other um, information to share about that, please jump in. Um, Fred's question about, can you design a course on a laptop and use it on a mobile tablet? Absolutely. So I use a laptop to do all of my course design work, but then I also use it on the mobile and tablet all the time. It should work. If you use the templates, all of that should work. And I've even edited my course from my mobile device whenever I've seen, oh goodness, I made a typo. Um, I've even been able to edit that directly from my mobile device. It was really, really easy. Okay, and then Anne, thank you very much. Anne says that HTML would be compatible for screen readers, so that's very helpful. Um, that was my understanding, but it's very nice to hear. Um, you confirm that you've actually talked to the experts and that is in case, in fact, the case, so. So that's everything that was involved in chat. I know that that's a whole lot. Um, did I edit in Pulse app? Dave, I edited it in the Pulse app actually. Um, what, what it really does is I'll access it through the Pulse app, but then if I want to do something further, it might take me to the Brightspace Daylight instance, but I don't have to do anything. All I do is access it from the app. It takes me directly there and I just click edit HTML. So from my perspective, it's not, it's almost like I didn't even leave the app because it's not like I had to open a browser and type in elearn.mtsu.edu. The app takes me directly there without making me log in somewhere else. It makes it very, very easy. Does anybody have other questions that we haven't talked about in the chat, but other questions just about using this kind of tool in your courses? Um, I, I had a question about the Google slide thing that you mentioned. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so um, where do you embed that? How would you embed that in one of these templates? Sure. Let me show you. Yeah. I'll show you an example. Let me try here. Um, let me get back to my share screen. And then I'll show you from one of my courses. 
how I did it. So for example, I think I'm still in my fall class. Okay, so what I did is I actually went in and pulled the embed code from Google Slides. So if you're a Google Slides user, let me navigate to Google Slides. Okay, so let's choose our chapter three presentation and then you'll actually go to, um, this always takes me a minute. Um, I want to share. You can tell I haven't done this since I actually put them in the course. I think it's right there uh, on the top. Yeah, under file. Thank you. Yeah, it is right, right yeah. in front of me. Okay, so there are a couple of ways to do it. And so you can do either a link to it, but I actually use the embed code. And so I want to find how to show that to you. And this may be something that I need to remind myself how to do it. And then I could send you an email, but you can see what I've done is it's embedded here. And then in the HTML, this is where I did the thing where I changed it to um, the height and width so that it will display. But then you can see instead of like a PowerPoint where it just shows as an image file, mm -hmm. and this way students can actually use the directional arrows to click over. Okay. It's still not as interactive as if you were giving the presentation, but it's a way for them to not get all of that content at once. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, some of our students, I don't even particularly love these PowerPoints, but some of our students really like them and want to, you know, print them or use them to take notes. So we do include them. So why don't I, let me go back and remember how to get the embed code and I'll share it with you. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, that's it's okay. been a while since I've done it. <laughs> yeah. And in those slides, can you also include links to external sources as well? Does that work like it does in yes. the PDF? Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It does. Hey, Lane, Any, isn't that yes. a calendar tool um, dynamic? for the Pulse app, since a lot of people use the calendar rather than putting in a separate assignment schedule, isn't it also dynamic? I think so. You know, honestly, I never use the calendar tool for myself in there, but I would think that it would be. I'm opening my Pulse sense. app to see. Right. Um, I'm opening my Pulse app to see. And students, I know another feature of the Pulse app is that students can add their own things to their calendar. So if a student needs to add something like they need to make an office hours appointment or if they want to say, hey, start on your article review, they can actually do that. I'll share this part of the screen. Let's see if I can share this with you all so you can see it. Okay, so this is what the uh, Brightspace Pulse app on my tablet looks like as far as when I click upcoming at the bottom right, uh, excuse me, bottom left, then you can see for this, for, it's saying that this is for things that are for me, um, where a student could click a date. And so I'm assuming that a student who's enrolled in multiple courses all of that is going to show up here. This is a little bit hard to demonstrate because I'm not a student, so I don't have multiple deadlines from courses that I'm taking. Um, but I, I would assume that all of that's going to update automatically for students. I don't know. I'm sorry. That's not a feature that I'm using, so I don't know specifically. Other questions? Okay. Well, if anybody, I'll hang around for a few minutes. If anybody else has anything else you'd like to add, 
or ask. Um, I, I will say I do really think they're really helpful templates, but I think the best part about the templates is they're really, really easy to use. They um, There's really not a big learning curve to them. It's just like editing any other page. Um, and it, it's amazing. I mean, I think that it makes such a big difference in the way that your course looks um, and especially makes a big difference to those students of ours who might be really relying on their mobile device as their primary course access tool. Um, I think it's one way that we can kind of reduce that sort of cognitive load and anxiety on them. It's a way for them to sort of um, access their course without having to have a complete laptop or desktop computer. Lane, I have a question. It's sure. Fair. So I have moved towards doing more HTML style already, but I didn't know about the templates. And so mm -hmm. I've embedded a lot of content. Do you have any tips for working backwards or the best ways to go to already created content, extensive content in a course and, and making it match this format so that students can access it on their mobile device? Oh, Claire, I wish I had better news from <laughs> from what I'm, I'm going to have to do it over. <laughs> well, I mean, from what I, I don't know that you have to do everything over, but from what I read, whenever I was doing these, um, and this was, of course, I was doing these in spring 2019. So it's almost been two years. But as soon as you select one of those templates, it's going to overwrite everything else that's in your course in that on that page not your whole course but on that page so let's say you were you already had a module introduction and you want to now use a template for that if you choose template anything that's in the html editor is going to go away so i think probably the best recommendation might be to request maybe a new course shell or create a new file not, not even a new course shell create a new file maybe have two um, windows open and then select the template that you want to use in the new file and then try to copy and paste but don't do, do paste um, unformatted text or copy your text into like a notes editor where it strips out all of that formatting and then paste that unformatted text into the uh, template editor and then you would have all of your content and then you just might have to actually do a little bit of formatting. I think it depends on how many different headings and other kinds of things you have in your current course to to really be able to know how much work it would be to convert them over. That makes sense. That <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I really wish there's I not a short news. way. It makes sense, though. I don't think so. It's really, I think, unfortunate that it overwrites everything. It would be nice if it could just apply that style sheet mm -hmm. to the content that you have there, but it doesn't sound like from all the inf documentation that I read in D2L that that's possible. Maybe one day. <laughs> Maybe one day. That's right. <laughs> Thanks. Sorry. Anybody else? Other questions? Elaine, can you show me again how to download the templates? Cause... Yes, sure. Um, let me share the screen. Okay, so what you'll do is you'll navigate over to that D2, I'm going to Google it again, D2L responsive templates. And when you find their page, it's kind of buried in the middle of the page. It's under the section that says to get started. And it's the bullet point number one, download the attached package. And you'll just click that, which is a zip file. It will download it to your computer. As I said, my computer says that it's something it wants to be very wary of. Um, Mine says it uh, can't be downloaded securely. So you just ignore well, that? Mine did too, and I ignored it. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Right. Probably not a good example in computer security, Dave. Um, <laughs> okay. Now that works. But I, I just, I just ignored it. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't hear you mention that previously. So okay. I don't know why it did that. I'm, when I first downloaded them, it did not do that. So okay. this is new, and I just decided to be brave and ignore that warning. <laughs> and I don't know that. It's, okay. So and then you go to manage files and upload. Upload. That's right. Mm -hmm. And let me see if I can find them. And they should okay, just great. Perfect. And you see Thank them. You. And then you just click that little down arrow to the right and choose the unzip option. 
you have to unzip them first. Oh, okay. Before um, you can use them. I'm not seeing a. Do you see the little right arrow? Let's see. Well, I'm doing it in the quick access. So let me go to the, where are my downloads? Here we go. No, it's. Let me show, let me share this screen again here. Okay. So I've already unzipped mine, but you should see something that says Brightspace HTML template, and it will say probably dot zip at the end. And then you should be able to click this little down arrow beside it and select unzip. So I didn't get that far. I was trying to upload them oh, and it says oh, okay. the file is empty. Oh, which tells me it didn't download. It didn't download it correctly. Maybe um, I can, okay, hey, Lane, okay, I got it, I yeah. got it. Lane, go. Kim, if yes. you are using a Mac, your Mac typically automatically unzips. Um, or Mine did have, not. My yeah, Mac sometimes that did happens, not unzip it. That's what happened with the, um, the remote instruction standards template. A whole lot of people who had Macs, especially if it was an older Mac, it would unzip it and then you couldn't load it because it was no longer a zip document. So double check and make sure it's actually zipped or it will not open. That's it will not really load in detail. good to know. Dave, do you happen to be using a Mac? Oh, no. No, no I'm, in the I'm in the college of business. I don't think we allow Macs in there. <laughs> <laughs> no, I got it though. I think uh, I just okay. hadn't, when I got that error message, I just ignored it and I had to actually click keep. Oh, okay. So now, okay, got it. And then when you upload Thank it, you. let's hope it's got zip on there and then you just yep. unzip it and then you should be able to do the rest. That the document that they provide that says the template guide is so helpful. It really does step by step. So if you ever get caught at a particular place, refer to that because it's really good. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Sure. It's good to see you again. Yeah, same here. Anybody else have any questions? Tips? If you're already using these, you have <laughs> advice. All right. Well, I will stop our recording.